again, so there are also individuals with bipolar mm -hmm. disorder. So sometimes their symptoms, um, they have some overlap with ADHD and that's true for both youth mm -hmm. and adults. So teasing those things out, it's really important. And one of the big, um, one of the big uh, markers of that is um, to really look at people's kind of activity levels and their sleep. Mm -hmm. Cause even though people, in, if you look at TikTok videos and social media, a lot of people with ADHD report problems with sleep, but that's not a cardinal feature of ADHD. That there's a misunderstanding that like the only treatment for ADHD is medication and not everybody wants that and there are other things. What is up fam? Welcome back to the channel. My name is Phil Sarpon. This is Phil's Guide to ID. This channel is dedicated to all things psychology, wellness, and graduate school. Today we have a very exciting video planned for you all. I am going to be interviewing a psychiatrist. Her name is Dr. Zoe Martinez. She's a board certified psychiatrist and she specializes in the field of diagnosing and treating ADHD. Now, as many of you may know, you may already be in graduate school or you may already be mental health professionals in the field. You know that ADHD is a very popular mental health topic. And in this particular video, Dr. Martinez is going to really clarify how she diagnoses ADHD and what she does in the terms of the treatment of ADHD and what mental health providers should be thinking about when diagnosing and treating ADHD. She works with a platform called done it is a telehealth platform that also has online and app services to their patients what i really love about telehealth services is that they are really filling the gap in terms of accessibility from patients and clinicians and so she talks about her experience in using this telehealth platform and how it's helped her in terms of reaching out to her patients and going towards treatment of ADHD. And so I'm really excited to get into this interview because I think we're gonna get a valuable perspective in a field that you may not be very familiar with in psychiatry and kind of get the perspective of how they might think about diagnosing and treating ADHD. If you haven't already, please like and share this video, subscribe to the channel. If you haven't already and you're wanting to get more insights into some of the interviews that we've done, consider becoming a member down below. And if you have any questions, put it down in the comment section below or reach out to me on social media. With that, let's go ahead and get into Dr. Martinez's bio. So as I mentioned, Dr. Martinez is a psychiatrist. She's board certified in adult and child adolescent psychiatry. She's been working with the telehealth platform Done for two years now, and she's been doing telepsychiatry since 2015. She received her MD from UCSD and her PhD from UCLA. Let's go ahead and jump right into the interview. All right. Hi, Dr. Martinez. How are you doing today? I'm doing well. How are you this morning? Are you are you in California or Pacific time? I'm actually in Chicago, so I'm in, in the central time. Oh, so it's your, so you're uh, okay, so it's not the morning, or, or it's still the morning, but late morning. Got exactly. It. Okay. Yep. Well, it, it's so good to uh, to be able to connect with you. I'm I'm really excited to just kind of talk about ADHD. And uh, before we get started, I'd love to know a little bit about your background, about uh, your why you wanted to specialize in ADHD, and uh, just your educational and professional background, if you if you don't mind. So um, yeah, so I actually I have. Uh, my medical degree is from University of California, San Diego. I also have a PhD in behavioral neuroscience, specializing in um, psychopharmacology um, from UCLA. And I trained, um, I did my uh, residency and um, child fellowship at UCLA. Um, and um, so I'm board certified in both adult and child and adolescent psychiatry. And um, so I, as a child and adolescent psychiatrist had a lot of experience treating ADHD. Um, it's one of the very common disorders in youth. And now we're realizing that it's, you know, that a lot of youth don't outgrow it. That what used to be the belief that people didn't have ADHD as much as adults. And now we know that a significant number of youth who have ADHD continue to exhibit symptoms in adulthood. Wow. So. Yeah. Uh, you know, thank you for, uh, 
thank you for uh, sharing about that. I, I, it's interesting because, you know, yeah, in the CDC, I saw that anywhere from two to 5% of children are diagnosed with ADHD. And then even for adults, it could be anywhere from five to 12%. And so uh, it seems like the prevalence uh, in, in some aspects is, is increasing. Uh, I'm wondering, you know, for you in terms of your background, what does your day-to-day look like? Uh, how are you uh, going about your clinical practice? Are there other things that you're doing alongside clinical practice as well? So, yes. So I, um, for Dunn, I think who is the company that contacted you, I, I have, I have a, a relatively small patient panel. So I'll usually either see a new patient or a couple follow-up patients in a day. And then I have administrative tasks, and then I do things like this for marketing. Um, I do have two other part-time jobs, one of which I work with primary care providers to provide them psychiatric backup um, and to help them be organized to see um, patients in a primary care setting who have mental health issues, so that's not specializing in ADHD. And then I also supervise nurse practitioners in a different clinic, um, and all of this is remote. Um, and, and some of them do treat individuals with ADHD, but that, that the other clinic does not specialize in ADHD. And actually... It, for done, a significant number of my patients don't just have ADHD, or in fact, once I go through their um, assessment, it, you know, I have some people who mo- who have more depression, who have bipolar disorder. So even though they think they have ADHD, once we really get into it, sometimes there are other symptoms, or they might have ADHD and something else, but the other the something else is more important to kind of get a handle on first. Got you. Yeah, that that totally makes sense. Uh, You know, a lot of my audience are coming from clinical psychology backgrounds and are wanting to be mental health professionals in the field. And, uh, you know, it seems like uh, even with social media right now, there's a lot of information about ADHD, but also there's a lot of misinformation as well. I'm Mm -hmm. wondering if you could speak about what exactly is ADHD and what is what it what it isn't uh, for just some clarity for the audience? So ADHD, I mean, it, it is a psychiatric diagnosis, and it has essentially three components to it. People don't need to have all of them, so they can they can have different subtypes. Um, so one of the big um, symptoms or categories of symptoms are problems with attention. So problems with attention and concentration, organizing tasks. And those are the kind of symptoms that we see that typically persist in adulthood. The other two categories are hyperactivity, so excessive motor activity, um, like not being able to sit still, those kinds of things. And that's more uh, commonly seen with children. And impulsivity, um, again, more commonly seen in children and adolescents. So typically, the hyperactivity and impulsivity are less um, common. And we're not talking about, so I've seen a lot of things on social media where people talk about like overspending at, like as an impulse. And that's not really the kind of impulsivity we're talking about. It's more like running out in the street or blurting things out, like when you're in a conversation. It's not really, um, so I've seen a lot of things that people who have ADHD, they are attributing other um, symptoms and, and it, it, which may be seen in people with ADHD, but those are not the key features in order to get a diagnosis. Got it. Okay. Yeah, I, I think that does definitely provide a lot of clarity. I, you know, it's 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 been great with the you know increase in social media use, and it, it's, it has been really helpful to see a lot of different resources for ADHD. But of course, on the flip side, there has been all those different things, whether it's TikTok videos or Instagram reels of of people sharing about their experiences. And so, I'm I'm glad that you can speak to that. I'm I'm also wondering, you know, even from a, a clinical perspective, how do you go about maybe specifically diagnosing ADHD and, and what are some of the things that you look into and um, maybe some of the measures or tests that you use for diagnosing ADHD? So the, I mean, so the company that I currently work for, for adults, there's, it's a self-report checklist, basically. Um, it's the ASRS. It's, um, it's, it's not the only assessment tool, but it's available. It's free. It's, you know, pen and paper, or you can do it on the computer, but it's like a one page thing. So it's pretty easy to complete. And you just rate like how often, so it goes through categories of symptoms and people say, did this happen? Like never, sometimes, often, very often. Um, and, you know, so you get, get a sense. And a lot of times people have certain categories of symptoms, but not all of them. Most of the time I don't see people who say like very often to all symptoms. So that's for adults. For children typically, um, which we're, again, for done, we're not seeing um, youth right now. We have in the past, but most of the time pediatrician's office will have something called the Connor scale. And that's typically completed by 
a parent or guardian, um, and then um, a teacher or a coach or, you know, someone else, like another adult that gets to observe the youth in a different setting. Um, so that's, so that, so it's a little different, whereas adults, it's self-reports. And so we kind of look at that. Um, also for adults, they all, they also fill out um, rating skills about depression and anxiety, because mm. those things are, are, can occur with people with ADHD, but also sometimes someone who's very anxious or very depressed can have some of the symptoms of ADHD. So trouble concentrating, having a hard time sitting still, like a lot of restlessness, those kinds of things. And that they, it might be that they have more anxiety and people with depression can have a significant trouble concentrating sort of executive functioning. So it's important to see those things. And then um, again, so there are also individuals with bipolar mm -hmm. disorder. So sometimes their symptoms, um, they have some overlap with ADHD and that's true for both youth mm -hmm. and adults. So teasing those things out, it's really important. And one of the big, um, one of the big uh, markers of that is um, to really look at people's kind of activity levels and their sleep. Because mm -hmm. even though people, in, if you look at TikTok videos and social media, a lot of people with ADHD report problems with sleep, but that's not a cardinal feature of ADHD. And also, you know, someone who has a lot of insomnia also has frequently problems with school or work if they're not sleeping well. So it, uh, it's not, like, it's a, diagnosing them with ADHD and going through the symptom checklist is helpful, but it's also important to rule out other things. So I think it's great that there's more like peer awareness or, you know, people encouraging people, but I think that the responsible ads and things that I've seen all encourage someone like go talk to, you know, your therapist, your primary care provider, or, you know, if you have access, like a psychiatrist, you know, depending on kind of the level, but start by talking to a professional first. And so that person can start. So even if it's a primary care provider, they don't typically have that much time, but they might be able to refer someone. Yeah. Um, and I, you also, you mentioned that some of your, the people who are, you know, your, users, I guess, that um, pay attention to your, your service and your reporting are, are maybe psychologists or interested in therapy. So I think that there's a misunderstanding that like the only treatment for ADHD is medication and not everybody wants that. And there are other things. So there are ADHD coaches. There are other lifestyle changes that people can make that might help them, you know, get more organized so that medication is not the only answer. Yeah, I, I, I love that you share that because, uh, you know, I, I think, first of all, yeah, uh, being connected to the the platform done uh, was such a, a great kind of um, revealing thing for me because I, I knew that there were online platforms that were being created and apps that were being created to help mental health services. But I didn't know there was one specifically for ADHD. And, and so that was what in kind of intrigued me and in wanting to getting to know more. And I, I love that because I think when in telehealth, especially since 2020, there, there has been an increase in telehealth services and it's been really helpful, especially mm -hmm. for if patients are in rural areas and they can't have easy access to psychiatrists or psychologists or, or uh, even the accessibility and also the affordability of telehealth services. And so mm -hmm. um, for you, maybe you can talk maybe specifically about why you think there is an advantage for telehealth services and where you kind of see that going in the future. So I was lucky. I actually have been doing telehealth, not specific for ADHD, but for mental health since 2015. So many of my colleagues were forced into that during COVID and they hadn't had the experience, but I, you know, I think for a number of reasons. So you said, you know, people who are in more remote areas. So I've worked for county, California counties where people are in more remote areas. Even if you're in a less remote area, not everyone has transportation. Mm -hmm. Sometimes people don't have the job flexibility or if they have childcare responsibilities, you know, taking the extra time to drive to an appointment and yeah. like it's, it's helpful if you can schedule that for in your home. I also like when I get to see someone in their home or their setting. So I get to see their pets. I might get to see a family member pop in and out, and, you know, but it, it, I, it's, there's, you're kind of seeing someone in their own environment as opposed to in a, a more sterile office. So I also feel like it, it kind of helps to create rapport and bonding when you see someone in, in their home. I think that's, uh, I think that's fantastic. And yeah, I love that. I, I, I think as telehealth services becomes more and more prevalent, uh, there's definitely going to be so many more advantages to it. And uh, for so for myself, I am on the pathway to becoming a clinical psychologist. And for one of my first 
clinical sites. Uh, it was a neuropsychology site where we did a lot of testing for uh, just neuropsychological testing. And so we did do some testing for ADHD. And uh, it was, yeah, it was really helpful to do mostly, most of it was in person. But I think, you know, mm -hmm. even having an additional option for telehealth, for people that aren't able to come to the office and, and have a little bit more convenience, I think that would have been also really beneficial as well. So I, I kind of see other even private practices adopting a little bit more of that model or hybrid model uh, moving forward. So it's great to see that you've already kind of been participating in those in those areas. I'm, I, I guess my next question is, you know, in terms of uh, overall you know, for ADHD and the treatment, you did mention that, you know, there's coaching available. It's not just medication. Uh, what are other things that people can do for ADHD treatment? Because I know it can be really debilitating for a lot of patients. So, I mean, I think it's, it's helpful whether or not you decide you want medicine to get that diagnosis. Mm -hmm. So sometimes um, in some school, well, especially I would say schools are better at this. But this can include adults if they're in a professional school or college, or um, sometimes there are you know, accommodations that mm -hmm. can be made. So if that's like the, if that's the area, because it often is like an, either an academic or a professional setting where people are having the most problems mm -hmm. with their symptoms. So sometimes, you know, depending on what kind of place that you work for, what kind of school you attend, um, the Office for Students with Disabilities, mm -hmm. Or you know, in younger people, they can get um, school ser school based services. And then for people in their jobs, it's you know, it's it's becoming more common and recognized. So HR might be able to help someone. It might be like having a modified schedule, or um, maybe fewer meetings, or, or having a quieter workplace. So you know, so there are things that can be done in those settings. And then like personally, we like I always encourage people to to do things to try to have a healthy lifestyle, which of course we're all supposed to do. But I think it's even more important for people with ADHD because the more like dysregulated and disorganized their schedule is, the harder it is and the harder it is to keep track of things. So kind of things that sound really boring, like trying to like make sure you go to bed at a certain time and not being on social media or other things like it. once you once you decide it's bedtime, putting away the electronics and getting up at a certain time, trying to have meals at a certain time. And, you know, obviously everyone eats junk food sometimes, but trying to not like try to eat as healthy as, you know, as one can. Um, and I also regular exercise. I mean, it's a good stress reliever, but it also kind of, it does change um, hormone and neurotransmitter levels. So that also can help people sometimes feel more focused. It doesn't have to be super intense. I sometimes tell people just even to go for a walk, but to kind of just take a break. Um, and, you know, the truth is our environments, many of us have constant stimulation or like interruptions, like, and we're, you know, people are on their phones all the time. And that's not always good for people with ADHD when they, if you have trouble yeah. focusing. So also making changes in wherever your, you know, work or study environment is so that you do know that you need to have it a little more quiet, which might seem boring, but it will make you more productive. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I think that's so helpful. I, I'm even wondering, you know, uh, they're like for adults who maybe they weren't diagnosed with ADHD as, as children and they're realizing that there, there are certain things that are not going right. Maybe they're not concentrating well at work. What are some of the things, what are the, some of the main symptoms that you've seen for adult ADHD um, that, that people start to come towards you and start to get help? What are some of the common traits and characteristics that you've seen in, in that category? So, yeah, so, I mean, so you're mentioning things like people having trouble concentrating at work, being highly distractible. And I've definitely seen adults where they kind of, they made it through high school, they made it through college, um, but like, and now they get a promotion, which normally would be a good thing, but now they're having to kind of keep track of more people and more things. So when the job demands, for example, get more intense and, or like there's more time pressure, um, that's when they're starting to feel like I can't do my job. I'm, I'm making mistakes. I can't tune out, you know, other people in my office. And so, you know, even getting permission from your boss to have noise canceling headphones might be good yeah. if you work in a noisy environment. Yeah. Um, so, you know, so a little, just kind of recognizing your symptoms kind of without judgment and just figuring out what is the best environment for someone to focus mm -hmm. um, because it, it, it can be difficult. Um, people sometimes have trouble organizing mm -hmm. tasks. So this is something that like ADHD coaches or sometimes someone's therapist might help them to break down 
the task into more doable pieces. And these can be complicated, like work related tasks, but even things like, you know, doing the laundry mm. because, you know, so that's, that's one task, but actually it involves like, you know, organizing your clothes well, making sure you have laundry detergent or whatever, you know, so there's, there are different steps. So breaking like bigger things down into smaller, more doable uh, yeah. projects. And that also gives people a, a chance to feel successful. Mm. I've also um, uh, heard from both ADHD coaches and individuals with ADHD. They sometimes know that they can only focus for a certain mm. amount of time. So breaking down tasks into like half hour blocks or hour block. So you're, it's not like you're do, trying to do something for eight hours and then just getting caught up in your own thoughts and or feeling like a failure because you're like, well, I, I can't really get anything done. Wow. That's yeah. So that I definitely, I think that, and sometimes people with ADHD, especially depending on their age, and if they weren't diagnosed as kids, they just sort of feel like I'm not very smart or I'm lazy because, you know, I see other people getting things done and I can't get them done. So they internalize some mm. negative thoughts or maybe even things that they've been told like why can't you get this done like everyone else is i love how you share all those nuggets of wisdom because i think i've seen a lot of patients who are who are very intelligent as children and they did really well in school and so even though they had adhd they were high functioning they had high iqs and they were able to get good grades even with their adhd and they managed just well but then they got into the real world and they have way more responsibilities, not only with work, but now with family, maybe with kids. And so there's a lot of different things that they're juggling at the same time. And so I think it's really important. It's really cool to see these adults have some introspection and realize, you know, even though I was okay as a child, things are happening at a much faster pace and I might need to go get checked out and I might need to see a professional. It also reminds me of the biopsychosocial model where you're looking at these interventions from different different perspectives, right? And so from the bio part, there might be that medication that's helping for the psycho. Maybe it's that therapy or the coaching, right, in terms of organization and, you know, skills for executive functioning. But then even for the social part, you know, if your boss knows that you are diagnosed with ADHD, they may be more willing to give you some accommodations or to give you extensions on deadlines and things like that. And so when you're looking at that from that holistic approach, I think you can intervene with ADHD in multiple different aspects. You know, for you, I'm wondering, now that we've kind of gone through that piece, are there any other things that clinicians should be aware of when diagnosing this disorder? And what are some other approaches that you might think might also be helpful for uh, clinicians or future clinicians? So, I mean, I would say one of the things um, that it, it probably does get talked about on social media is, um, is to make sure that you have good rapport and you're honestly addressing any substance use issues. And not that and people have a substance use disorder, but I think like with, because some of the medications are controlled substances, so it's really good to get, you know, an honest answer about those things. And so it might not be as much of an issue in Chicago, but in California too, sometimes people are using marijuana to help with their sleep or their anxiety. And that's not really the best thing to help with ADHD. It tends to make people not focus as well. So to, to have a non-judgmental, honest conversation about like, well, what other things are you doing maybe to cover up, you know, negative feelings or help you sleep or you know, maybe you want to, you know, your, your job is so stressful, you don't feel like you're doing a really good job of it. So you go home and you know, have a drink or like smoke some marijuana or whatever, which again, not the end of the world, but if your brain isn't functioning at its, you know, optimal capacity, those things aren't helpful. So, and then also it's important to make sure that that's talked about that. Um, so I think if, if you do go down the medication route, that it's very really important that people don't, um, adjust their medications on their own and those kinds of things. And so sometimes, you know, I think that certainly American culture, West, a lot of Western cultures, like you don't feel good, pop a pill. And so it doesn't seem like it's strong enough, take two of them. So, I mean, so I've, I've definitely seen that in people who don't have a substance use disorder, but it's just kind of our culture. Like if something's not working well, I'll just try taking more. And I would just suggest that everyone work closely with whoever, whoever your clinician is, whether, whether it's with medication or not. So I know some people do see a therapist and it might be their primary care provider who's prescribing them medicine, but just to be sure that there's someone that you can speak really honestly with. And also if there are stressors, so you, as you mentioned, people do have things come up in their family. So maybe you kind of got it down at work, but then you come home and 
you know, things are chaotic or, you know, a, a, a parent moves in with you and now that disrupted your schedule. So just being really honest that you do as much as you can to support your own environment, but obviously living within, you know, what your other responsibilities are being part of a family. So. Yeah, I think there's a really interesting kind of misconception that, you know, if someone takes ADHD, ADHD medication, then, you know, all their problems kind of go away and that's really all they need. But it's like, actually, there's still a lot of work to be done in terms of the executive training that needs to be done in terms of helping them to stay organized and consider their schedule and whether it's food or exercise or sleep. And so kind of digging a little bit deeper into the medication piece, what are some of the conversations that you might have with patients for perhaps someone who's wary of medication or perhaps someone who doesn't understand how medication could also play into their overall intervention as well? So again, so so some of it is addressing if they're concerned that they're going to get addicted to something. That's a big concern for some people. And so to provide some education about that, um, there's pretty good evidence that people who take their medication as prescribed, even though it is a controlled substance that doesn't like promote addiction. And that's true for youth and adults. Um, it's when people try to like mess with their medicine without discussing it with someone. Um, also kind of like what, like there are, so not, there are non-stimulant medications that do help with some symptoms for ADHD. So if someone really has a big concern about um, stimulants um, because they are controlled substances, there are other options. And then the other thing is that I tell people that I, you know, I, I see medication as a tool. So you're right. It doesn't fix anything. So first of all, someone with ADHD isn't broken. They're just having some symptoms that are getting in the way. But I mean, it's the same thing if I want to fix my car or build a house buying tools it's you know it isn't going to like i still have to do the work so i think medication is exactly that it's a tool that may make the the things that you have to do a little easier to get done but it's not it's not fixing something so it is just a tool that you can choose to use and sometimes i tell people you can try you know try medicine see if it does anything good or bad and then you know come back in follow like so you you know send me a message um, we have a secure email um, you have a question about some things that it isn't or isn't. I mean, so it's not, you know, it, we don't know necessarily if medicine's going to work and which one is the right one. So it really is like developing a relationship. And again, medicine is a tool. It doesn't fix anything. Yeah. Again, I, you know, I really appreciate you sharing that because I know there's sometimes where there's a situation where patients I've seen will try maybe one medication and it doesn't work. And so they'll just kind of give up or they'll try a therapist and you know they don't have a really good relationship with them and so they'll just give up therapy. But what I've seen across the board from patients who are consistent and diligent in just trying multiple different things to get to a point where the intervention is working, they do tend to be really successful. And so even if the medication doesn't work right away, they might work with their provider to try other different types of medication. Or if the intervention with their psychologist or their therapist isn't working, they'll continue to try other things to figure out what will work. And so I, I think it's just a great reminder, even as a clinician, to also facilitate that and to educate those patients on that as well in terms of the process. But uh, overall, Dr. Martinez, I'm really just, yeah, thankful that you're, you're really highlighting a lot of really important key things about this whole process. I'm wondering for you, you know, there's so many different things that you do and hats off to you in terms of all of the different things that you do for patients. But how do you give back to yourself? What are some of the things that you do for self-care and uh, in terms of investing back that energy uh, into your life so that you can continue doing what you do? So I'm probably one of those people that does like, so I don't actually have ADHD, not right. I mean, it'd be fine if I did, but, um, but like many people, I do sometimes have stressors. So I, I do exercise regularly. I try to eat pretty healthy and I mostly make my own food, which is both healthy, less expensive. And also I like, I enjoy preparing food. So it's kind of something that I do that are like simple tasks. So, um, and I purposely take breaks in order to be able to do that. Um, and I, yeah, I try to, I have a pretty regular bedtime. Um, I have two cats that I love. So, <laughs> and so I think animals can be really helpful for people's mood and also um, depending. And so cats are less demanding about um, your schedule, but I know many people who have a dog and like part of the reason they get up at a certain time in the morning is the dog needs to go out. So that can be helpful. So 
So yeah, my cats just kind of cheer me up and they're funny. But that's def I would say that's a definitely a, a self-care thing. I'm so happy to hear that. Yeah, you know, we all need those self-care items to keep us going. And I'm also, you know, looking forward to 2024 and even wondering for you, uh, what are some of the things that you are excited about in your professional life? And what are some of the things that you're going to be working with, perhaps with done or just in general with treatment and clinical practice for patients? So, I mean, in terms of working with Den, I, again, I enjoy all of my, like, I would say like 99.9% .9 of my interactions with individuals. And again, I sometimes, I have people who are on my caseload who haven't yet decided about medicine. So I like that I have the opportunity to just kind of give, provide information, like be there in case, you know, I tell people you want to talk to your spouse or other family members, like we don't have to make a decision today. So not people, not feeling pressured and, have, and having the access, I think is just great. Um, and that, I would say that's what done. And then with my other jobs there, um, I, it's, it kind of reminds me of being in training in that when you're in training and you probably have this, um, you know, going to clinical psychology where you kind of have an opportunity to supervise and um, work with um, people who might have a little bit less experience in your area. So I am enjoying that those other opportunities outside of done uh, to like work collaboratively with people and hopefully help them on their journey towards learning and figuring out, you know, how best to help their patients. You know, along with that, I'm even thinking about the fact that you are a psychiatrist and, you know, there's so many different types of mental health professionals. I think sometimes it's really overwhelming for patients because they look at the mental health field and they see licensed clinical social workers and therapists and psychiatrists and psychologists, and it's hard to know who to go to. But I think uh, it's, it's so important, I think, even as professionals, that we can collaborate with one another. And I'm wondering about, you know, what does collaboration process look like for you when you're working with psychiatric nurse practitioners or maybe other psychologists or other mental health professionals? How, how do you see that in, in your model and when it comes to healthcare? So when, um, I, in terms of psychiatric nurse pr practitioners, they most of, they, they have to technically have a supervising um, psychiatrist um, or, or physician, uh, depending on the state. So um, they, but so that's kind of built into the requirements. But I like to encourage the people that I supervise to also like text me something in the moment. So yes, we have a planned supervision you know, at certain frequencies, I do chart reviews and give them feedback. But, you know, but in addition, it's like if you're seeing a complicated person. So I, I let people text me like clinicians and then try to get back to them, like kind of in the moment, because most people, you know, whether they're therapists or um, mental health nurse practitioners, psychiatrists or other, you know, and other specialties, people are just trying to get through their day and get their work done and get their notes written. And so then trying to remember who you had a question about like days or weeks later is difficult. So I just tell people, I might not be able to answer your question in the moment, but why don't you send it to me when you have it? And then we'll figure out a time when we can talk. And if I am working at done, if I'm working with someone who does have a therapist and they're, you know, and the individual is open to me talking to the person, I usually just, you know, a lot of it initially I'll text someone and saying, could we just set up a time to have a quick phone call? So yeah. So I think it's always helpful. And the same what sometimes someone wants to bring in a family member like to, to like, you know, and that, again, that's helpful that people have, you know, at home. It's like, could you talk to my spouse for a second? They had some questions. I'm like, absolutely, because that's someone in your support system. So. Oh, my goodness. Yeah, that's awesome. Well, Dr. Martinez, thank you so much for this. You know, I myself, I'm doing my clinical setting in an academic medical center. And we get a lot of referrals for anxiety, stress, uh, ADHD, uh, grief, trauma. And it's really has been great to be able to work with other professionals, whether nurse practitioners or social workers. And so I love that I had an opportunity to kind of pick your brain from a psychiatry perspective and uh, just to be able to see your thought process and the way that you kind of case conceptualize ADHD specifically. And so thank you so much for your knowledge and your wisdom and your experience in this. I'm really excited to see what other telehealth programs and apps will do in the future in terms of meeting the needs for patients. And yeah, once again, just thank you so much for your time. Thank you too. Good, and good luck to you. It sounds like you're well on your way. So That's awesome. Well, we'll we'd love to have you back.